Hello, this is the monthly webinar of Hihashi. I am Fabienne Hemans and this is Paul Thomas. You want to say hi? Hi, hey, everyone. And today our guest of the month is Dr. Vesna Skull, who will be coming soon. But before we give the space to Dr. Skull, we would like to introduce you to our amazing team and co-host of our upcoming summit launching November 6th to the 13th. And it's a free online summit. It will be fun, dynamic, very different than the last year summit. And it will, um, and I will leave now to the host to share a little bit of why that is. And we'd like to invite now Dr. Andrea Yanakayama. Would like to introduce yourself. Hey, hi guys. Hi. I'm excited to be here with you and to talk about the upcoming summit. So thank you for having me here. Uh, so I'm Andrea Nakayama. I'm a functional medicine nutritionist, and I was really excited to be asked to co-host the Healing Hashimoto's 2017 Summit and to lead a track. And my track is all about partnerships, and this is a key tenant in functional medicine. We really are aiming to create therapeutic partnerships between the patient and the practitioner. But there's all kinds of partnerships that we like to create when we are patients and that I like to encourage our clients and customers to create. Those are partnerships with their body, with their diet, with their family, with their physician. And so that's what my track is all about. There's six amazing interviews that I can't wait to share with you. And they're all my favorite. I, I really can't say which one is my favorite, but there's some unusual players. So I'm excited to introduce you to Donna Jackson Nakazawa. She's an author and a journalist. She wrote The Autoimmune Epidemic, The Last Best Cure, and Childhood Disrupted. And she's going to talk to us about partnerships with your family. And I'll be introducing you to Eileen Laird, who has the blog Phoenix Helix. And we're going to talk about partnering with your diet and what it's like to eat an autoimmune paleo diet or to find the diet that's right for your body. So I'm excited to dive in with you guys and really explore all the different kinds of partnerships that you can have to support your self-care and I should say I'm a Hashi girl myself so I know what it's like I um, manage my own Hashimoto's and so I really do get it from every perspective from the practitioner perspective and the patient perspective Oh, lovely. We're so excited to have you. Cannot wait to just have that partnerships track up and live and running on November 6th. Yay! Yeah, I can't wait to share it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, Andrea, stay with us. Uh, we're going to introduce Sachin and Dr. Natasha Falahi as well. Um, so these are the three co-hosts that are uh, joining us right now tonight for the webinar. Um, and we're just thrilled to have them all here with us. Uh, so, Sachin, if you want to share about your track um, with the audience. Sure. Okay. I just have to unmute myself. Thank you, uh, ladies, for having me on this. It's nice to balance the feminine energy with some masculine energy. So, I really appreciate and I'm honored to be part of this group. And I had the privilege of hosting the lifestyle track. So, what's really cool about this uh, summit is that we're incorporating a lot of lifestyle not just clinical aspects but things that you can do in your home and action steps that you can take immediately so I had the privilege of interviewing some really amazing people um, Anthony Swa who's doing a, uh, a film called Organic Rising he's an investigative journalist uh, for National Geographic and photographer and he captured this amazing uh, you know journey of organic farming and it's really amazing how this impacts not just Hashimoto's patients but uh, health in general and he dropped some really incredible information that I think is going to be uh, groundbreaking for a lot of people it was for myself as well so we learned so much information about how just eating organic sometimes isn't enough and so I think uh, that'll be a really a good introduction to uh, his work and then I'm, I also interviewed Sarah DeFrancesco she's a naturopath and she's amazing as well. And what we talked about was we talked about using animals in therapy uh, for healing Hashimoto's and supporting people. And she's a big equine fan, so she loves horses. And she's used horses therapeutically for herself, but also her patients. And she's going to talk more about that. I also interviewed a hypnotherapist and mindset mastery coach, uh, Jillian. As we know, the thyroid 
is in our in our throat chakra, and many Hashimoto's patients don't fully get to express themselves. So uh, she talked about how to do that, and I also speak, spoke with an energetic healer, Selena Moon, uh, who talked about energy healing for thyroid medicine, uh, for thyroid uh, care. And then I also spoke to Jen Pike, who is the founder of the Simplicity Project. So she keeps things really, really simple. So I love that about her. And I am really excited to share these uh, amazing ladies with all of you. And the information that you're going to gather is going to be very life-changing, but very applicable and immediately applicable, which is what I like about it as well. So, you know, being part of this was, was amazing, but I got to interview some amazing people. I'm excited to hear everyone else's interviews as well. Yes. And that's why it's going to be so different because it's really interactive this year and it's dynamic, it's with patient, it's stories. And we're going to have an, uh, Dr. Natasha Falahi talk about her track now. I just want to say too, I get a sneak peek of all the videos and I got to see um, Dr. Sashin's like spotlight video that he made himself and it's really awesome. He, he goes around his house actually and shows all the things that he uses that make for a healthy home environment and I have all the same things in my home so I thought that was a really awesome video in addition to his interviews so don't miss that one too. Thank you. Um, and so I'm Dr. Natasha Falahi. I am honored to be hosting the Mind Body Track and I'm really excited about this because the Mind Body Healing was one of the biggest components for me in my own autoimmune, autoimmune healing journey. I too and Ahashi's sister and celiac as well and just multiple autoimmunes that I dealt with naturally and reversed and am thriving right now due to all this mind-body medicine. Um, so I actually was incredibly honored to interview one of my favorite authors and doctors, uh, Dr. Mario Martinez. He wrote The Mind-Body Code and The Mind-Body Self and has some phenomenal ideas about how our mind impacts our neurology, our immunology, our endocrinology, but in addition to that, how our culture impacts our health. And I think those, that's one of the most important messages that I've ever heard in my healing journey. So I had a really great interview with him. Um, I also spoke with Dr. Chetis Chu, uh, my husband and business partner. He's a functional neurologist who uses brain hacks and things that you can do every day in your life to actually use your five senses to improve your health. So through touch, through smell, through sight, sound, taste, all of those things. So he actually goes through a really fun do-it-yourself, um, seven steps of how you can stop anxiety using your five senses. And that was a really fun interview. We did that one in person. Um, and I spoke to some other really amazing founders and doctors of their clinics um, and their techniques. And we go through things like bioenergetic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic Indian traditional medicine, um, and just bringing a lot of different perspectives to how we view health, healing, um, disease, where it comes from, and the mind-body aspects of that. And finally, I'm super excited. Um, I have decades ago experience in making my own film, so I shot my own spotlight video as well, and I made a little mini documentary about um, being a canary in a coal mine, which is what I think of as all my Hashi sisters and brothers and autoimmune um, cousins, that we are these really sensitive canaries and we're in this environment that is toxic. And the ways that we can honor that sensitivity in ourselves to achieve maximal healing. Um, and so I made a little mini documentary on my track as well as my spotlight video. So I hope you all get a chance to see that. Thank you so much. And we are then, so excited to have all of you guys here. And the summit is going to be, I am keep saying epic, because it's the first one ever like this, um, just for the viewers out there. Um, so these are three of our co-hosts. We actually have two more that um, actually aren't with us tonight, uh, Mickey Trescott and Stacey Robbins. Mickey is hosting the Food and Recipe track, and Stacey's, uh, and Rock Robbins are hosting the Four Loved Ones track. Um, and, you know, the Heihashi team had this idea earlier on, and it's just such a really riveting way to, to bring all of these healing methods together um, and to really just kind of um, allow you to kind of choose how you want to integrate them all. And it just gives you options. It gives you the ability as a person wanting to heal and inspired to just to um, be able to come to, you know, just come to a space of your healing where, you know, it's, it, there's choices 
you know, there's there's all different types of methods you can use. So uh, we really hope that uh, you guys can join us. Um, and Fabian, if you want to share about the patient's track, we did that, which is amazing. Yeah, Pearl and I are hosting a track called the Story Track, and we chose uh, selected uh, some beautiful, inspiring stories that really touch us. And you know, because some of us really transform their life uh, 360 degree in like in every aspect of our life because we had Hashimoto. So we really wanted to share those stories with you. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's. It's to show that having Hashimoto's, there is possibility to thrive in your life. And there are ways, there's amazing people out there right now, and we interviewed them, these patients who have shared their story, and you know, it was not an easy road for any of them, um, but they came out into a space of their life that they never expected to be, and Mitch Hankins is an incredible story, so excited to have him with us. Um, he actually just got married um, <laughs> last month, um, but he's a um, he's a blogger, author, and um, also another patient, um, Alana Nur, who this was her first like interview ever. She just stepped up and um, just has an incredible patient story that she just wanted to share with people um, like herself, you know. So uh, we're really excited to have uh, those stories told. Yes. And so this is a, is a free event, you know, so join us and because we want to share all these beautiful stories with you. Join us, register on our website or on the media. And um, yeah, I think this is one of the first multi-host summits that have ever been put on. So it's really great because every day you get to see a different track, different concentrated topics. And you get to see all of us and Mickey Trescott, Rock, and Stacey Robbins um, bring our perspectives to all the people we interview. Mickey has a track full of you know amazing collaborators that she's worked with, like Angie and Sarah Valentine, and people who are really big in the food um, world. And then we also have um, you know the big thyroid experts like Dr. Jatice Karazian and Dr. Isabella Wentz on our For Loved Ones track, and um, Rock and Stacy are speaking to them. So it's really great because this is the first summit where you're getting so many voices and so many perspectives from patients to experts to health um, coaches and practitioners, and they all bring a little piece of their experience and their healing to those stories. It's all yeah, I think one of the things that I really loved about being a part of, or one of the co-hosts and a part of the summit was the opportunity to curate something different with this audience in mind. So really thinking about who do we want to think about and what are the different areas when I'm only focused on this one particular arena of care. So I got to say like, through the realm of partnerships, who is it and what are the different kinds of partnerships, which is different than thinking just from the global level of Hashimoto's, which I've done before as well, and that leads to a lot of similar conversations in some ways, and this really allowed us to take a different lens in each of us, like you were saying, Natasha, and I think that curation piece was really exciting and we've curated it with all of you in mind, really thinking about what are the things that bring a different perspective, a fresh perspective to your own home and self-care. Yeah, we really try to view and to think about all the aspects that we, you know, encounter in our journey. And so on the on the track of the relationship to the loved ones, um, Stacy and her husband Rock share uh, and invited some some expert that have uh, either their daughter or a family member that have Hashimoto. And so they share how they navigated their journey living with someone that is really challenged every day. And so they're, they're going to really, we're going to go in our vulnerable place together and um, it's really beautiful. We're very excited to bring you this. Is there anything else? So much more, but yeah. Yes. So so much. Much. <laughs> I just I want mean, to say thank you. Exactly. I just want to say thank you for including me and uh, 
and for allowing me to be part of this special journey. I think that, you know, I know we've said this many times, but this is really special. It's really different, and the feel is really different as well. So it's it's cool to be on the other side as a co-host and to see all the work that goes into this as well. I, I might uh, I wanted to add that as well that. You know, people who put on summits make it look really easy because there's a collaborative effort and a, and a group of people that help put it together. But behind the scenes, it's it's a lot of work. So I just wanted to honor all of you for putting in that time and energy and effort and sleepless nights and I'm sure hair pulling sessions um, were abound. But uh, we've, we've pulled it off and I think we did a spectacular job. So I'm excited for people to see it. Yes, and we words can't express how much gratitude we have for the experts like you guys joining us as co-hosts. You know, I, Fabian and I were talking about it earlier. It's like, wow. So we have these people, and they're right next to us right now, sharing. You know, the top, um, you know, needs for healing right now here. So thank you for being with us. We're very grateful. I've, I've been working with Pearl and Fabian for almost the last full year. Um, doing creative direction work and being a board advisor for Heihashi and I was first introduced to this organization last year on the summit where my husband and I were speakers on it and it was such a phenomenal summit. Um, the information that was shared and just the heart that was behind it was what got me on board to volunteer with them for the past year and work and um, you know just as uh, June was saying it's this is a nonprofit organization so everybody who's doing this is doing it because they have Hashimoto's or they have a loved one who has it or they have patients or people that they have very close and dear to them who has suffered and overcome a lot of things that have to do with Hashimoto's so it's a really unique space where there's a lot of heart in this summit um, and a lot of heart behind the organization and I think that's another thing that uh, that is very unique about this summit um, as opposed to any other summit on the internet at all, is it's not um, it's a nonprofit and it's really driven for this information and this community around people coming together to share all of this and feel together. So thank you, and um, we want to also acknowledge. Uh, Dr. Sachin Patel for being on the board of directors with us this year. We're so excited to have him join us uh, back in January. It's been, um, yeah, this year has been awesome. It's been a powerful year. It's <laughs> we've learned a lot, and it's um, you know being a younger nonprofit in the world, and and especially this autoimmune world, um, it's important to really like see you know to keep that heart uh, up close and to know why we're really doing this. So. And it's, it's really for the patients out there, you know, um, looking for answers. And we really hope that the summit, um, you know, really sheds light on a lot of those things that you're wondering and, and uh, questioning for yourself and for your loved ones, even your friends, and sharing it with people. You know, uh, we really want everyone to share this information. It's, it's, that's what it's about, continuing to grow community and, um, and being able to give this information to people out there who maybe would have never thought of it because of you. So, um, so we're excited that you're here listening to us tonight. And yeah, um, I encourage you while the summit is happening, um, all of you who are here tonight may have already registered or are anticipating watching it as it comes. But we really encourage you to share it with people who you know um, may need this information, or people that you might even suspect might be um, dealing with things that are Hashimoto's that are not diagnosed yet. And while the summit's happening leave comments and interact with us on our Facebook page because we're really here watching and excited for all this to be released. So we are all going to be seeing those comments and responding in real time and excited to see the response from the community because that's the idea of this nonprofit is that we are friends coming together and healing together. Awesome. Well, that concludes our summit um, share for tonight. Uh, I want to thank all three of you for being here with us. Andrea, Sachin, and Natasha, and um, we'll see you guys at the summit. Um, <laughs> and yes, please join us again sometime soon. Thank you all. Thank you. See y'all at the summit. See you soon. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Andrea. Bye. So yeah, so I guess we could um, move on into the next section of the evening, um, yes. and I'll share with the 
with the viewers um, a little bit about the logistics of how these webinars go. If you haven't been here before, um, pretty simple. But as an attendee of the webinar, um, you have a microphone and you also have a camera, but it's all going to be turned off. So, um, but if you have a question, um, there's actually a question box, and you can actually ask the question in the questions box. Um, and you can ask it at any time during the webinar. And what we're going to do is Dr. Skull is going to come on soon, and she's going to share with you about all this awesome information and educate you on women's hormonal changes and the symphony of it all. And, um, and then after that, um, we're going to do a Q&A with Dr. Skull. So here she is, Fabienne. I'll give you the reins. Yes, Dr. School, hello. Thank you so much for being with us and for your patience through the introduction. We're so excited to have you tonight. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. School. She is the founder and the medical director of the Comprehensive Center for Women's Medicine, a multi specialty holistic medical practice for women in Chicago. Through her work with the leadership of the American College of Physicians, she has helped guide, shape guidelines um, for educational requirements of internists through all of the nation's medical universities. This earned her, among many other teaching awards, the college highest recognition, the Laureate Award. She was ranked as one of the nation's top doctors by U.S. News. She avidly supports organizations empowering girls and women and protecting our environment. Thank you so much for being with us. Yes, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Fabienne and Pearl. Um, I feel um, so honored to um, be with you on this evening when we've just heard from um, wonderful organizers and co-hosts of the upcoming summit, and I will make sure to share it with many of my patients and colleagues. Um, I am really privileged to be here and uh, look forward to our chat tonight. Yes. So. Uh, did you share, Pearl, about the raising hands if people have questions and, and things like that afterwards or if they can write? Yeah? Yeah, I am just about the questions box, yeah. Um, if, yeah, if you have a question, um, like I said, just put it in the questions box and we'll answer those at the Q&A tonight. Great. Dr. Vesna, could you please describe your practice with us and share um, about your experience with patients with thyroid disease. So, like I said again, gratitude for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, the uh, practice that um, my partner, Dr. Huer, and I share in Chicago has been built on um, 66 years of, of joint experience. Um, I was allopathically trained as an internist and uh, boarded in internal medicine, but soon after that, in the mid-80s, um, felt that I really wanted to specialize more and um, uh, work with women, so additionally trained in women's health. And um, as it became apparent to me within the first year, years of practice, that my style and my approach to um, healing patients was very different from the traditional American style of disease-based uh, medicine. I sort of started delving into ways in which to integrate um, aspects of ancient um, medical practices, collaborative approach, um, as was mentioned earlier, partnership uh, with other practitioners, which led to fellowship training and board certification in anti-aging and functional medicine. Um, as, su as such, and, and you know, looking at my career, I really don't think of myself as um, an expert in this field, but I think of myself as a perpetual student um, because every patient and every colleague collaborator teaches me something new. Um, there's a pearl added to my toolbox to help the next patient and the next patient achieve um, their optimum health. And my hope really is that um, as I work with patients over time, um, I really make myself obsolete. 
Uh, so empowerment of women to uh, practice what I call self-sustainable health through education partnership, a partnership is how uh, my practice functions. So um, my experience with patients uh, with thyroid disease has been paralleling the experiences of nation with thyroid disease and autoimmune disease on the rise. And, and quite frankly, if you look for it, it's there. We just need to identify um, it and uncover and unearth um, the most common chief complaint in a, in a primary care a physician's practice is one of fatigue. And underneath that blanket complaint um, certainly lies uh, a patient with a thyroid problem or many of the other hormonal imbalances that we're going to talk about um, as, as uh, the conversation evolves. Um, as you mentioned, you were seeing uh, a rise in autoimmune disease in your patients today um, in the last three decades. So what do you attribute this to? Well, look around us. We live in um, a, a, a world that's driven by stress and toxins. Our patients, uh, particularly younger women, are balancing uh, very fast-paced lives, balancing their work, juggling careers uh, with personal and family issues. And then those of us in the sandwich generation are caring for the elderly aging parents, worrying about the teenagers or the millennials in our lives. And combine that with roller coaster of perimenopause or menopause, you have a, a perfect situation of heightened stress and, and challenges. On the toxin side of things, um, CDC has registered more than 87,000 toxins since World War II, and we are exposed to them every single day um, in a, a, an abundance and, and rates much greater than afflicted our grandmothers throughout their entire life. From the air we breathe, the water we drink, or shower in, to you know, the food we ingest, the, the cosmetics we use, the lifestyle habits, including these and electrosmog and, and uh, um, radiation caused um, problems are all integral part of this um, emergence or uh, increase in autoimmune disorders, cardiometabolic problems, infertility, and neurodegenerative issues that all of which are presenting into a practice of a primary care uh, practitioner every day. Yeah. Could you please describe a typical thyroid patient that you see? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, just about every patient that enters through the door is a potential thyroid patient, but most are fatigued. And as fatigue can be multifactorial, we obviously, it's imperative that, that a thorough history is obtained. And, you know, I like by, at, just, I like to start by asking my patients if they could recall the time when they last felt great. And then kind of from their answer, we create a longitudinal timeline and a story. And many of these stories have very similar underpinnings as they are are often very precisely identifiable triggers that may have started the onset of the thyroid disease per se. I, um, you know, feel that that um, we think of, you know, thinking of hormonally uh, turbulent times like puberty and adolescence, then um, peri and and postpartum period, peri and postmenopausal times times when women are on hormonal uh, contraception. So many, many of our patients are struggling with, um, with uh, consequences of hormonal challenges, whether physiologically or induced. Um, many patients come and are struggling with weight. Um, they have absolutely tried every diet in the book, every ex exercise. Uh, a trick and or visited every personal trainer and are unable to shed the pounds despite trying their hardest. They've tried every 
green detox. They've tried every fad diet. They have, um, you know, uh, basically uh, gone the gamut, and they're still um, challenged by inability to lose weight. They all complain of some degree of skin and hair issues, whether the hair is thinning or falling out in chunks. Um, or skin is drinking gallons of moisturizer and still feeling uh, dry and rough. Uh, it's all there, but let's not forget the digestive issues. Um, whether they're bloating and food intolerances or frank constipation and uh, uh, very serious problems sometimes landing them in the emergency room. Um, so that's a typical de novo patient that you always have to think about thyroid when they present with any of those. But another very common patient in, in my practice, which mm -hmm. sort of draws patients um, who are seeking integrative practitioners, are the patients that are diagnosed with um, autoimmune hypothyroid disease, but who were told that, you know, they need not worry about those antibodies. Once there, they're always there. Um, they come in with perfect labs in the box, as they call them, having been started on um, thyroid replacement um, with conventional physicians. And um, they started feeling better, but now they're, they're crashing and everything on paper looks perfect. So that's the other category of the patient that we often see. Can I ask you a question? Um, what came up to me when you were sharing about the menopause and everything? What what causes early onset menopause, like women in their mid thirties to late thirties? So I think we are seeing not only the changes in the onset of, of menopause in some instances, but we're ch we're seeing a, a huge increase in infertility, and that may be interrelated. Um, it is all predicated, in my opinion, by an autoimmune challenge that those individuals have. So by definition, even in the conventional medical terms, menopause before age 40 is considered premature. Um, by and large, that is an autoimmune disease until proven otherwise, and those patients frequently come to me with uh, other autoimmune conditions, thyroid always sought and frequently found. Um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, GI stuff, um, uh, celiac problems. So again, whenever I see a young woman going into the perimenopause, menopause before age 40, I always think autoimmune and let's look for other comorbid conditions um, in that type of a patient. Hmm. What is then your approach for treatment to treatment? So basically, you know, we obtain after um, history is obtained, um, I review the data they frequently bring along. And believe it or not, in 2017, when so much is known about how to properly diagnose thyroid disease, many of my patients still come with basically just, a, you know, bare bones, basic chemistries and a TSH, thyroid simulating hormone. And based on that information, which often reveals the thyroid simula simulating hormone to have been elevated, uh, originally elevated and then subsequently normalizing because their prior practitioner started them on um, treatment with Synthroid or uh, several of its uh, um, generic equivalents. Um, but there is no vitamin D levels, there's no nutritional analysis, no other hormonal evaluations. Um, however, all of that would be considered within the realm of traditionally acceptable um, medical evaluation of a patient with thyroid uh, issues and appropriate treatment. Well, we obviously know that that's far from being, being true. So we will then obtain the TSH, the free T3, free T4, reverse T3, thyroid antibodies, TPO or, um, and or antithyroid, a thyroid, um, a thyroid globulin anti antibodies. But I always like to consider and frequently obtain a four point cortisol, uh, four point salivary cortisone for adrenal evaluation um, because 
adrenal fatigue and hypothyroidism are frequently seen together and, and not it is not easy to clinically differentiate the two. So treating the thyroid without under understanding that there might be adrenal underpinnings may be the worst thing to do for a hypothyroid patient. They may have an initial improvement in their symptoms when um, exogenous thyroid hormone is provided, but they frequently crash and um, because their adrenals are now on even greater overdrive with um, supplementing with thyroid hormone. Now, I don't really want to be um, misunderstood as either arrogant or uninformed when I say that it is almost irrelevant what replacement therapy is recommended as, you know, it may vary from patient to patient. Um, and I sometimes have to change medications in the same patient until we hit the sweet spot for replacement. However, um, you know, if, if there is a skilled uh, compound in pharmacy um, around and uh, partnering with a uh, compounding pharmacist to compound our hormones for optimization of individualization of treatment is really my preference. But, you know, honestly, unless or until we look at the root cause of the problem to begin with, it really is far less relevant what medication we give the patient um, because they're not going to get better unless we look at the toxins and their nutritional um, deficiencies and therefore the need for replacement um, and, and uh, sort of look at the this uh, initiation of a detox program, uh, nutritional analysis, and um, then individualized treatment. So let's talk about the nutritional analysis and the detox treatment. So we've al alluded to the um, toxic soup we, we live in. A ton of toxins, daily exposure to them, um, you know, people are, are unfortunately not making the greatest of dietary choices. They're eating food look-alike substances and they've removed themselves from whole foods. Um, they're engaging in behaviors that, especially my millennials, you know, they work hard, they party hard, so there's alcohol involved, there's not enough sleep involved. And um, the um, even the individuals who have sort of gotten a sense that they need to eat better and are looking towards more organic and, and, and whole food choices are not getting the same macro and micronutrient content in the foods uh, that they're choosing versus the, the foods that our grandmothers harvested from their gardens. Now, the uh, very alarming emergence of information even in allopathic medical literature about uh, ravages of glyphosate, um, the chemical found in Roundup, is really correlating with increase in a variety of things, from epidemic of obesity to cardiometabolic issues to cancer, and it makes it imperative to impart, impart on our patients consistent and rigorous approach to seasonal cleansing. So even if uh, there is no weight loss agenda for people. Even if you're eating a clean and lean diet, we absolutely need to follow the seasons. And you know, in, in many cultures, um, Eastern cultures, that is a ritual. And we now have a reason for that ritual in our polluted Western world. So I recommend that um, we, we undertake this uh, way of nutritional cleansing at least once in a season. Um, and then, you know, uh, what about nutritional support? Every patient is different, and it is very useful to know what one's nutritional makeup is like. Um, Spectrocell laboratories utilize a uh, methodology that allows us to see the inside of the cell, not just look at the serum values of, of specific nutritional um, uh, uh, vitamins and micronutrients and antioxidants and it also provides us with a specific map of oxidative stress of an individual. So I very much like to get that information and with it then can um, 
uh, support the patient with appropriate recommendations. Uh, once we've assessed that nutritional status, again, getting back to the hormonal eval, um, everybody should have a four-point cortisol, but peri- and postmenopausal women are also subject to other hormonal influences on production and or sensitivity or effectiveness of thyroid hormone, namely through disordered estrogen and progesterone metabolism. So I like to obtain a full hormonal panel as well. Yes, so important. What about overall dietary recommendation, nutritional supplementation, or restrictions? So, um, so then we get on um, a little journey with you know choosing the what I believe is the, the the best underpinning of a diet program that isn't going to be one size fit all, but a core of it will be. Um, after a 10-day uh, dairy and gluten-free cleanse, primarily based on a rainbow-colored uh, uh, vegetable eating plan, I actually frequently recommend that patients stay um, as close as possible to, the, to that lifestyle, namely gluten and dairy-free and anti-inflammatory dietary free because there is significant relationship between the between gluten and biosynthesis of, of uh, thyroid hormones and most people with autoimmune disorders are best served with nutritional recommendations that support a gluten-free lifestyle. Now the list of thyroid supporting foods and supplements is long and you've heard it many times before but let's suffice to say that it is absolutely necessary to ensure adequate intake of certain vitamins Vitamin D, which actually some will argue is really more a hormone than a vitamin, is incredibly important and, and uh, needs to be measured and not just um, placed in a, a satisfactory range, 30 to 100 is typical norm for most labs. 32 is compatible with life, but it's not optimal. So optimizing vitamin D into the you know, 70 to 80 range, uh, very important making sure that um, there are enough B vitamins in the diet and or through supplementation. And, you know, many people um, ask me if I routinely test for, um, uh, uh, for uh, TGFR mutations, but um, I like to, but don't always, because um, there is such a high incidence of um, uh, impaired methylation that also correlates with uh, autoimmune thyroid disease that um, supplementation with high quality methylated Bs is also very, very important. Nutrients like zinc, selenium, and um, I am going to say uh, uh, and mention the controversial um, nutrient iodine in iodine deficient Hashimoto's patients could be life-saving. Now, the challenge is, as I'm sure many of my predecessors have discussed with you, um, what methodology do we use for adequately assessing the um, iodine stores, etc. Uh, my recommendation uh, typically is if we find it on you know, a urine or, or a blood test in a person who is not supplemented, to be in the low range to um, supplement with with lower end um, uh, uh, iodine iodide combination to not precipitate the uh, potential problems that many of the autoimmune um, Hashimoto patients have with excessive iodine. So um, that said, let's not forget about inflammation and inflammatory food, inflammatory um, influences of that food on our gut, um, and after the beautiful 10-day cleanse, let's not go back to our standard American pro-inflammatory diet because unfortunately many of the systems uh, depend on clean and especially your, your gut. In the last 10-15 years, we've come to realize actually that just about everything that's important originates in our gut. Um, as you know, most of the immune system, over 60% of it, resides in the GALT or gut-associated lymphoid tissue. So how can that immune system function properly if our gut is not functioning properly? 
Um, poor gut health is a significant factor in triggering autoimmune disease to begin with, as well as contributing to functional hypothyroidism, even if antibodies are not necessarily found. And I believe that in a certain percentage of Hashimoto patients, we can look and search but won't find, um, and yet they fit the profile beautifully in their comorbid conditions that put them in that category. So poor gut health depletes body of nutrients that support the thyroid health and, um, as we mentioned, zinc, selenium, um, tyrosine, vitamins A and, and D and Bs are important. And therefore, indirectly, the biosynthesis of T4 and T3 is impaired. Unhealthy gut doesn't allow the proper estrogen or xenoestrogen excretion. So there, again, is that hormonal imbalance that results in now estrogen dominance. So what happens with that? Well, estrogen competes with binding proteins and, and, and thyroid binding uh, transport proteins. So the, even if we have adequate amounts of thyroid hormones, they're not getting into the cell. They're not exerting their effect on a cellular level. So um, it's important to fix the gut. Um, because there are obviously so many um, watershed effects that we have. So what I like to do then is employ the 4R approach to gut health. Namely, number one R is to remove the irritants, detox, and, and, and eat healthy. Number two is to re-inoculate. Um, we all carry anywhere from four to, to six pounds of gut bacteria in our gut. Um, just a single course of antibiotics can usurp the beautiful microbiome that works very hard on generating all of the necessary components and ingredients of, of, of um, functioning uh, human. And imagine it, it takes some repairing and uh, a re-inoculation of the good bugs to put them in balance with the bad ones. So probi probiotics, particularly combined with prebiotics, the food for the good bacteria, um, additional uh, systemic anti-inflammatory agents, which will help heal the lining of the gastrointestinal tract are usually the, my go-to when I'm talking about the re-inoculation. Now replacement, what does that stand for? Well, it stands for uh, replenishing the hydrochloric acid, which is so uh, absolutely um, essential in appropriate absorption, um, it, replenishing the digestive enzymes, supporting the gallbladder, and um, providing the vitamins that are necessary for the um, optimum functioning of those. And then finally, um, the toughest thing for patients to sort of buy into is the long-term repair. Because it is not easy, and you know, uh, whenever you talk to a Hashi survivor, you will all have been there. You know that you know it, it took a lot of guts, no time, no pun intended, to say no to parties, to say no to conventional foods, to say no to alcohol, to say no to a lot of social engagements, which in this country all pretty much rotate around um, spirits and, and food. And to stay true to your healing foods and, 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 and gut support. But over time, um, and I always tell patients, this is not a short-term fix. This is really a lifelong challenge. Over time, we can get there, and we can get that vibrantly healthy gut. And from there on, or up, if you will, um, everything else ensues, so to speak. A lot to take in. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, it seems, you know, it appears that all the nutritional and hormonal aspects of our health are just so interconnected. And so maybe tell us more about how you test for hormonal competence and what's your so approach. Now to the fun part of kind of putting it all together, and um, this really is how all this works, the hormonal symphony, low thyroid function, is almost always secondary to some other condition. And we've mentioned adrenal stress, and let me, I cannot emphasize it enough that you know, um, 
responses to our being chased by a tiger on a daily basis um, so increase our, our um, stress hormones, cortisol in particular, um, and there is then uh, this loss of communication um, between the adrenals and the brain and um, there is sort of a, a lost message to the master gland of the body, the pituitary, which just does not sense things properly and that communication is broken, so hypothalamus and pituitary go offline, if you will, um, and they typically are the conductors of that hormonal symphony. So when the hypothalamus and the pituitary weaken due to these mixed messages from overstressed adrenals um, that are not able to communicate well with other parts of the endocrine system, what we see is that again adrenal stress increases thyroid binding uh, proteins so T3 and T4 cannot get into the cell there's also an adverse effect on conversion of the inactive T4 into active T3 and on top of that now the cells are no longer sensitive to even the small amounts of circulating T3 now adrenals also relate to the progesterone. When they are continually producing cortisol under stress every day, the pituitary becomes sluggish from this overwork. And as a result, the reproductive system sort of suffers long term. And in women we see low progesterone as early as you know mid thirties and a lot of that manifests as PMS and or again inability to conceive there's low testosterone in men. And what do we do as conventionally trained docs? Well, you know, look at the commercials. What to do about your low T? Well, we give men testosterone. Not the right thing to do. Uh, we're not addressing the root cause. Now, adrenals and estrogen, too much estrogen. We've already talked about the connection of um, xenoestrogens from uh, environmental pollutants, plastic, etc. Um, that contributes to the uh, interrupted uh, transport and biosynthesis of thyroid hormones and not enough T3 getting into the cell um, and um, allowing it to function properly. Now pr prolonged um, exposure to cortisol um, then runs down the liver's ab ability to get rid of those um, accumulated estrogens and as a, as a result both estrogen and its metabolites and some of which may have very adverse effect on on human breast health etc circulate back into the bloodstream become uh, overabundant and same thing uh, occurs with thyroid binding globulins and further then um, the thyroid hormones go down so addressing the adrenal health uh, via first getting to know your four-point cortisol and in the early stages of adrenal fatigue, cortisols are high, uh, correlating with agitation, stress, anxiety, insomnia. But as we progress without treating the patient, um, they deplete the ability, the adrenals are depleted from the ability to produce the cortisol and you know in the latter stages of adrenal depletion of fatigue there is no hormone and that's the patient who doesn't get out of bed so um, similarly exogenous hormones which are prescribed abundantly to teens for you know non uh, I, I love that you know they they say non um, birth control uh, um, reasons treatment of acne or treatment of um, bad PMS. But those girls really do like the safe birth control methods. So some practitioners feel very comfortable prescribing birth control pills starting at menarche and stopping them essentially at menopause with an occasional break for pregnancy if desired. Now that formula may have worked 25 years ago or so, 
not anymore. We're seeing actually more and more young women who'd been on long-term oral contraceptives when they get off of them have a tough time getting pregnant. And some of that has to do with the exogenous hormones, which are probably suppressing the pituitary. And when pituitary is offline, um, the whole symphony is off. So there is their interconnectedness, very, very um, important for the patient to understand and the practitioner to kind of know how to assess and then what to do. Yes. So let's look a little bit back. Can you give us a little summary of all your recommendation? Because you gave us a lot of information. You know, as, as, um, as we live in a toxic zoo, I think my first recommendation is detox and avoid environmental toxins and consume mostly plant-based organic, di organic diet as uh, frequently as possible. Gut, 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 clean it up. You know, clean up the gut. Now, balance the Th1 and Th2 arms of the immune system. Um, essential actually to clear the xenoestrogens and other environmental toxins which interfere with optimum thyroid hormone production. And, um, I, you know, I used to be more vigilant in checking the, the interleukin-1 and 2 and, and uh, other cytokine, cytokines and, and teaching patients what type they are, if they're Th1 dominant or Th2 dominant. Really, it doesn't much matter. If there is dissonance and disequilibrium, we need to fix that because without fixing the immune system and its balance, we're really sort of missing the boat. And then that's, again, gets us back to the gut. So detox, clean the gut, balance the immune system, support the HPA axis, support the brain, the pituitary. And I love, um, providing adequate nutrition to the pituitary or master gland in the form of a secretagogue, uh, a substance that is non-hormonal, but results in hormonal balancing. So food for the pituitary, amino acids and botanicals can restore the balance of the director of the symphony and the symphony hums by production, better production of end organs uh, and end uh, organ uh, hormones. Sleep is an incredibly important and cheap commodity. And um, until I was 40, 45, I thought that going on four to five hours of sleep was absolutely marvelous. It allowed me to be a super mom, a super doc, a super woman. Well, consciously really brought myself to this seven or eight, and for some patients even more, eight to nine hours of sleep so our bodies can repair. So get enough sleep. Um, engage in regular, regular practices of mindfulness, meditation, spirituality. Our, our mind, body, spirit is so important to be in alignment that no matter what I tell you to do or what you eat or don't eat, unless there is that connection, um, things are not going to hum and things are not going to fall into place as they ought to. Exercise is key, but very careful with exercise prescription, especially in my adrenally exhausted patients because while once upon a time exercise made them feel great, Excessive exercise with production of, of uh, free oxygen um, radicals and, and uh, reactive oxygen species may actually create more inflammation and um, give them a significant setback. So gauging the exercise to tolerance of patients and helping, helping them build up that tolerance is uh, important, but also reminding them to uh, neutralize those free radicals with ample and appropriate antioxidant consumption. And, you know, last but not least, um, clearly many of the Hashi patients need to resort to medication. And if and when it's necessary for individualized treatment, I do. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, compounding thyroid is great, but um, uh, uh, some patients have do done well with uh, appropriately timed synthetic products, and I think that's the key because of the differences in the half-life of 
T4 and T3. But one thing to, to take away, I think, from this discussion is that one size does not fit all uh, is the paradigm of successful medication treatment of autoimmune diseases that are seen in thyroid disease. Um, so, you know, with that, um, again, individualization and looking at the whole symphony and the whole patient is my approach to a Hashi patient. Mm, beautiful. I love it. Amazing. So I think we are ready to open um, the lines for questions from the viewers. Let's see if they have some questions. Yes? Um, Should I be able to see that or are you guys going to? No, we're going we're gonna to read it to you, Dr. Vesna. Do you want to take the first one? Sure. Yeah. Um, and everyone feel free to start asking questions now as well. Um, the line is open. Uh, okay, so I have recently been diagnosed with Hashimoto's, but my question about my is about my daughter that has low T2 and has attention issues and has been diagnosed with bipolar. Can some autoimmune diseases cause some bipolar symptoms? So, um, you know, uh, pediatrics, not my specialty. However, um, what we're seeing in... Um, younger and younger patients is again emergence of autoimmune diseases. Um, what um, statistic that I am familiar with is one of autism that um, clearly is linked to toxic exposures and it is now as high as 1 in 49 in some states but it's typically about 1 in 60 across the nation. Um, along with it, may uh, uh, we are seeing some behavioral um, and mood disorders as well. Um, in a young child with uh, um, a, a bipolar disorder, I think I would look for um, underlying nutritional or autoimmune um, issues as well as um, uh, really try to clean the diet and look for toxic exposures as well. Um, for every mother who is faced with probably a medication choice um, in a young child um, and or a diagnosis that, that follows them their entire life, a life, a lifetime, it's important A, to validate the diagnosis, but it also would behoove you to work with an integrative nutritionist to work with um, a specialist who can look at functional neurological testing of the brain because there are certain deficiencies that may mimic as depression, anxiety, and or bipolar um, that can clearly be noted on brain imaging and, and activity of, of the brain can be followed and um, the abnormalities reversed with initiation of appropriate lifestyle changes. So again, not my specialty, but I would urge the mom to look into functional neurology and or functional um, psychiatry and actual imaging studies that would sometimes light up in the areas of the brain that uh, traditional med medical community would medicate and um, oftentimes nutrition and, and um, clean lifestyle can, can um, completely eradicate. So the viewer that was asking the question uh, just uh, added that she was 19, that she's 19 years old. The, child, the, the young woman is 19? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, same is true. Uh, same is true there. Um, cleaning up the teenagers um, diet is not always the easiest, but uh, you know, going um, as uh, as clean and as organic, um, and again, looking at uh, reversible causes of a psychiatric disorder is certainly a, a first step that I would undertake. Great. We have a question from Suzanne. 
um, how do I find out what the correct amount of vitamin D, probiotics, thyroid replacement, uh, glucosamine, calcium and magnesium, vitamin B12 should I take on a daily basis? <laughs> okay, well that's a loaded <laughs> question there, right? Um, and you know this is a great question because so many of my patients come to me literally with suitcases or backpacks full of pills and you would think that they're getting adequate levels. Um, it all depends on the type of nutritional supplement, how it's absorbed, why it's not absorbed if it isn't absorbed. So I would definitely start with um, taking a look inside. So first and foremost, knowing where the, the patient's um, nutritional status is. And I like SpectraCell because it gives us um, actually a value of what the nutrients are like within the cell and not in the serum. Um, so because it's a sophisticated test that takes your own blood, grows your own T cells and culture and incubates them with a variety of different um, nutrients and then finds the sweet spot, if you will, where your cells are thriving. And that's where you should be. And if you're below that or above that, you're too toxic or not have enough. So, um, you know, conventional RDA um, requirements are really to basically sustain life without you dying. So they're certainly not optimal. Um, and the perfect example here is even if we measure the vitamin D level, the range is so huge for most laboratories. I use Quest laboratories and their range is from 30 to 100. Is 31 normal? Yes, it is. Is it optimal? Absolutely not. So for certain conditions, including getting back to the first caller, uh, neuropsychiatric functioning um, is found to be markedly improved when we push that vitamin D level in the 70s, 80s, even 90s. And toxicity is seldom seen unless there's sustained exposure to high doses of vitamin D in excess of 200. So again, for some vitamins, we can definitely measure them conventionally, find the sweet spot, and then you know individualize based on that. But the intracellular uh, analysis, and then um, that particular test also gives us something called um, antioxidant index, or which is ability of our cells to deal with oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is one of the things that ages us, that actually creates, uh, that shortens our telomeres and, and changes our, our chromosomes. So it's very useful and good to know where we stand. I'm not sure that I answered that to your liking, but um, you know that would be kind of my approach. Great. Um, she also asks, uh, Suzanne says, what can I do right now to help with my hair loss? With hair loss? Yeah. So I think that, uh, you know, as, as we've talked, um, it's multifactorial and uh, replenishing the nutrients that are missing, um, getting rid of toxins, big, 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 and um, addressing the dysbiosis and the um, imbalances in the, in the GI system. And of course, there, you know, there, there are many vitamins and many companies that are touting and targeting and, and, and um, pointing to their efficacy of hair loss and skin and nail vitamins. Um, there haven't been many that have actually had clinical trials and, and one has, and this is really not a promo for, for any products or any companies, but um, there are, uh, there is a, uh, a company out there that has skin and, and nail product that has been studied that actually has been shown to be helpful. Um, some other non-nutritional uh, support to enhance the regrowth of hair um, that is actually gaining some traction and it, it, um, it is completely safe is a PRP therapy. PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma and um, our own platelets have a lot of growth factors. So some hair restorative physicians are offering this type of treatment in alopecia 
um, uh, of both male and female type where those um, growth factors that have been harvested from our own cells are actually without any ill effects stimulating the regrowth of hair. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Vesna. Yes. We, we have a question from Ingrid. Where do I get the proper testing to determine if I have Hashimoto's or a similar autoimmune issue? So as we were talking, you know, there are um, some tests that are easily done by conventional laboratories, by conventional doctors. They just need to be prompted. Um, an integrative medical practitioner will not have to be prompted, and she or he will order the testing that we've talked about, namely um, the levels of free circulating uh, thyroid hormones, free T3, free T4, thyroid stimulating hormone, the antibodies, TPO and anti-thyroglobulin um, anti antibodies, and sometimes reverse D3. Um, so that would be a panel of thyroid tests. But then, you know, um, as I mentioned before, where one autoimmune disease lives, look for other um, issues and other particularly hormonal disturbances. So um, a four-point um, uh, uh, salivary cortisol is very useful in addressing the adrenals. Now, if there isn't a, an integrated practitioner in your area, um, there is a lab that I use and like very much because it is the premier and um, leading saliva lab in the country called ZRT Laboratories. They also do something um, called uh, blood spot and saliva testing where a patient can, you can go online, get a kit and actually do your own testing, but then they will provide some uh, interpretation of the results. However, I always urge if patients go that route to then find an integrated practitioner who can help them um, individualize the approach to treatment. Can you um, explain the point four or the four point cortisol, like what that means exactly? So it's four times during the 24 hour period um, we spit in the tube. So um, as I think one of the genetic commercials out there says ladies don't spit well you really are going to have to work hard to produce saliva uh, first thing in the morning um, and then midday 12 noon um, between 4 and 5 and then at bedtime the um, advantage to the salivary uh, hormonal assessment versus serum assessment is uh, several fold First of all, it allows us to recognize biologically available free hormones. Um, second of all, um, it saves you four trips to the lab. Uh, and uh, I dare you to find a Quest lab that's open at bedtime. And then um, there's actually a, something physiologic that can happen when we, uh, even with a small needle puncture of vessel, our stress hormones can go up and you can actually get a false temporary increase in cortisol. So if you're depleted, you may look like you're normal. If you're normal, you may look like you're elevated. So for that reason, I really almost 100% rely on four-point salivary cortisol. Thank you for explaining that. And Madhu says, thank you. We've been struggling for five years with this issue which is the woman with the daughter of 19. Um, five years with this issue and traditional medicine is not working. I appreciate the seminar. Well, um, uh, be vigilant and you know, I'm happy to at um, another time provide some references to um, uh, colleagues who have done remarkable work um, mapping the neurochemistry of the brain and looking at the functional approach to um, uh, neurological and mental health. Thank you. We have a question from Tammy. I've been diagnosed with Hashimoto since I was 29. I began perimenopause at 38 and I was tested and found that I was in full bloom, bloom menopause at 44. I have not had a period over four years and I was recently told I had anemia. I've had history of anemia. 
is there a correlation between autoimmune disease and anemia? My physician has never really given me much attention. And, but as an exercise physiologist, I need to have full access to oxygen. Indeed. And actually, there is, um, there is association with um, thyroid disease and anemia. Um, there is also a, an association, um, as we mentioned before, um, between thyroid disease um, of autoimmune type and premature menopause. Now, menopause at 44 is technically not premature, but having started it or in, in your 30s, you have started the, the journey certainly very young. And um, um, as we pointed out before, it is really important to balance all of those hormones and nutritionally support you, um, in which case there might be answers to the anemia that goes beyond just the, the um, association that is seen with autoimmune uh, thyroid disease and anemia. Um, so full investigation um, is uh, appropriate uh, if nutritional support has failed to correct it. So the next question is from Mel Gorzat, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, hello, so I have been diagnosed with Hashimoto's two years ago and I would like to know what is the appropriate dosage um, I should take if my TSH is 8. Currently, I am taking 90 mg's of the thyroid. Is this the right amount of it? Thank you. So that's where um, things get tricky because if you recall, um, you know, we've talked about individualizing approach without longitudinally knowing what your um, uh, treatment history has been. I couldn't really specifically address that. But suffice it to say that um, both the TSH and measurement of, of T3 and T4 and autoantibodies can vastly oscillate in the course of treated or untreated Hashimoto's thyroiditis and hypothyroidism. So um, that is where the treatment gets tricky. Obviously, you need more because the TSH of 8 is not showing appropriate um, uh, response. Now, do you need more or do you need to clear your receptors? Do you need to make sure that exogenous thyroid hormone is actually getting into the cell and doing its job? So remember what we talked about in that hormonal symphony. Is there too much xenoestrogens flowing around and is there competition for thyroid binding globulin so that even the thyroid that you are taking is just kind of floating around and not getting inside of the cell where it needs to exert its effect. So really looking for all of those comorbid conditions, if you will, would be the way I would proceed. If I see a patient in whom, you know, I'm escalating the dose of treatment and nothing's happening or the TSH is barely budging. Thank you. Um, let me just check with you, Dr. School. Uh, do you want to take one more question? I know it's already 9.20 almost. So one more question is fine for the road, right? All right. <laughs> so a question from Julie. So many folks do all the right things. They detox, they have great diet, work on stress reduction, exercise, yoga, etc., and still are unable to crack the code and regain their health. I know you have had great success supporting and treating women in becoming radiantly healthy with Hashi. What are your thoughts on this? Oh gosh, Julie, um, out there, you just described a second patient of my day today. I had, um, so let me share her story and maybe that will answer your question. I um, saw a lovely 32 year old woman. Um, who uh, you know, was seemingly healthy when I saw her a year ago, a busy professional, uh, referred to me by an aunt of hers, age 56, who had Hashimoto's, and after a struggle, had actually gotten herself in remission through my 
um, comprehensive system approach and, and hormonal approach. So patient who we will call K, um, um, which is the initial, first initial of her name, um, after a workup that we've done, um, it was determined that she was not only hypothyroid, but had severe adrenal burnout. So her adrenal curve was like almost completely flat. Um, she actually saw a respected endocrinologist. They put her on Synthroid, and um, they even added a little T3, even a little Cytomel. So she had a beautiful six weeks of improvement, and then what I told you earlier happened, and she crashed, and that's when she saw me. So a year ago then, we um, started looking at the complete hormonal symphony for Kay. Um, we looked at her diet, pretty clean. Um, she was, but she needed uh, very aggressive GI support, which was provided. Um, she started practicing daily meditation um, and, you know, uh, was um, uh, self-treating uh, with what seemed to be uh, appropriate supplements until she got, she got to me. But um, as we mapped her road to recovery, I really basically told her to put away uh, a um, backpack of her supplements and I try to simplify her nutritional support because what happens uh, very often is become so engaging and so overwhelming that even though a patient feels better they can't keep up with it. So we basically um, stopped her oral contraceptive which was contributing to her estrogen dominance and um, poor clearance of, of estrogen. Um, we um, we helped balance her Th1 and Th2 system, which also, by the way, helped with her seasonal allergies with an immunomodulator. Um, she is enjoying benefits of B vitamins, vitamin C, and liposomally delivered um, blend of B vitamins and adaptogenic herbs, and her adrenals are not have recovered dramatically in the first three months. And her HPA axis has been supported by a secretagogue, um, basically a blend of amino acids and three, um, three um, botanicals, which has improved her sleep, her focus, her concentration, brain fog is gone. Uh, her diet is clean and um, remains to be. So month three, she is probably 50% better month six, so I see patients like on a continuum, and today was our anniversary visit. And at our anniversary visit, Kay was vibrantly beautiful, healthy, new job, um, new blog, blogging about her health and empowering other women to really take ownership of their own health, and essentially dismissing me because my job is done. I have created um, a self-sustainably healthy, uh, radiantly healthy um, patient who now can just touch base with me once a year, and that really is fulfillment of my goal as an integrative pr practitioner. So thanks, Julie, for asking the question, because that really kind of um, describes what I see myself in doing and that is facilitating optimum health through awareness, consciousness, and you know, self-help. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. This has been fun and uh, what a company of, of, of great folks beforehand. Looking forward to the summit and uh, to you know, be available to um, viewers if they have any additional questions through Fabian and, and uh, uh, our dear Pearl. So. Yes, we'll forward Good that night. to you now because there's a few more questions and so we don't have time to answer them but we will address them in an email. Um, thank you for being with us everybody. So you, thank you for, I know we took longer than usually. Thank you for that extra time. So visit uh, our website heyhashi.org and and uh, register for the free uh, summit coming up.
November 6th to the 13th. And, um, what Thank you so much, Dr. Spall. Yeah, that was so riveting and just so eye-opening for, for me and, of course, all the women out there. So thank you for being with us. Yes, when when I met Dr. School, uh, I was a, in remission from Hashimoto, and I was about 85% or so, I would say. And I can't thank you enough for taking me, you know, to that extra step that I was kind of stuck. You know, I, could, I, I just couldn't get there. And um, I'm so grateful to you for taking me well, where I wanted to. Thank you for inviting me um, to share. And, you know, it's all about really um, taking the women who've, who've done the work, who've uh, um, been on the journey, and helping them find the refinement on the cellular level, cellular detoxification and hormonal uh, alignment. So um, it is so rewarding to see you glowing and to see all my patients thriving. Um, it's a great but challenging work that we all have together. Yes, and it, it's never finished, but it's okay. It gets, it gets better. So thank you, everybody. Have a great end of the evening, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Good night. Good night.